Good evening. My name is Chase Robinson, and as president, I have the privilege of welcoming you to the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Some background. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which we plan to discuss in terms of strengths and areas for improvement. <laughs> it became the law of the land in 2010, <clears throat> and it placed major regulations on the financial industry. Emerging from the Great Recession, it was intended to prevent another collapse of major financial institutions, oh. such as Lehman Brothers. Dodd-Frank was also geared towards protecting consumers with rules such as sheltering borrowers from abusive lending and mortgage practices. It contained some 16 areas of reform over hundreds of pages, thanks to the very hard and effective work of its two co-sponsors, one of whom joins us tonight. Dodd-Frank, it should be noted, has fans even on Wall Street but clearly the conversation has shifted. And President-elect Trump is expected to target requirements on lending, disclosure, and liquidity that he considers overly stringent. Indeed, there is speculation he may wish to repeal it. So, we approach this evening with a different tone and a different set of questions. I should say that the conversation is taking place here is no accident at all. The Graduate Center is the hotbed of vigorous intellectual debate and activity, reflected in our doctoral and master's programs, our 30 odd centers and institutes, the dozens of events that take place here every week. We have some 4,000 PhD students pursuing degrees in a wide variety of subjects, and every year those 4,000 PhD students teach about 200,000 CUNY undergraduates in every classroom in every borough of the city. This institution, I'm especially proud to say, is becoming the single most important locus for the study of inequality, an issue which is clearly intertwined with tonight's theme. We can boast leading researchers, experts, we can boast the world's most important income database and a variety of programs, most notably the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality. I should also say that CUNY, which enrolls some 275,000 degree-seeking students, is itself an extraordinary project in reducing inequality and increasing opportunity. 42% of CUNY undergraduates are the first in their families to go to college. 40% come from households with annual incomes below $20,000 a year. The Graduate Center, which focuses, as its name would suggest, on graduate education, is a crucial part of that project. For these and for many other reasons, we could not be more proud than to host tonight's conversation which features two of the nation's most prominent thinkers on finance and finance reform. First, Barney Frank served as a member of the House of Representatives for more than three decades, and in that time became one of Congress's most respected and most powerful members. From 2007 to 2011, he was chairman of the House Committee on Financial Services, where he led the passage of the Dodd-Frank Bill. At the height of the subprime mortgage crisis, the New York Times wrote that Frank, quote, emerged as a key deal maker, an unlikely bridge between the party's left wing base and the free market conservatives in the administration. He's also known for his fight against the impeachment of Bill Clinton, for his trailblazing announcement in 1987, while still serving as a member of Congress, that he was gay and for his sharp and insightful wit. In fact, he is rated the brainiest and funniest congressman in more than a few polls of Capitol Hill staffers. <laughs> now retired, Barney Frank remains a public critic, recently publishing a Boston Globe op-ed in which he wrote, and I think this captures something of his style, 
Apparently, one aspect of American greatness that Donald Trump seeks to recreate is the Great Recession of 2008. <laughs> he is joined on our stage by Paul Krugman, Nobel laureate, New York Times columnist and author, distinguished scholar here at the Stone Center, and distinguished professor in the PhD program in economics. He's been called the most important political economist in America. He's the author of numerous best-selling books, including End This Depression Now. He served as a consultant to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the World Bank, the IMF, and the UN, as well as to a number of countries, including Portugal and the Philippines. In his Times column, he's asserted that Dodd-Frank's rules have had a real effect in reducing risk, and post-election, he predicted what may lie ahead. If we face a new economic crisis, perhaps as a result of the dismantling of financial reform, it's hard to think of people less prepared to deal with it. With that sobering assessment, please do join me in welcoming our distinguished speakers. So let me say just how, it, I, I think it was actually my idea to invite Chairman Frank, I'm gonna use the title just once, um, to, to do this be, uh, because, um, actually part of it was that when we organized this, we thought we would be talking about how to move forward on financial regulation, um, but also because uh, Barney Frank is really exceptional, not just in being a tremendously influential and effective congressman, but in being someone who actually knows what he's talking about, which is fairly rare in that position. Um, and um, and everything he's done on, on actually every issue I know anything about, but certainly on, on the financial issues has been uh, extremely intelligent, extremely uh, cognizant of, of the realities, uh, both economic and financial, and uh, on one side and, and political on the other. Um, so it's a pretty unique opportunity. And of course, the Dodd-Frank financial reform is one of the, uh, I, I would have said, uh, well, I, I will still say, was, is one of the two signature achievements of, of the Obama years, and uh, everything, all, all those signature achievements are somewhat in question now. Um, but I w we can certainly start from there. Um, a plan, just to let everybody know, obviously everybody is thinking about the uh, sort of non-financial reform question of what the hell just happened, um, and we won't avoid it entirely, but it, it, it'll take over everything if we start it with it. So uh, we want to start by talking about financial reform, the financial system, where we're going. Um, and I want to start, Barney, with a basically a, a question. I, I want your take on what it is you were seeking to do and how. I mean, the, if, if I can say, um, a, a prop, sorry, I'm talking too much, but a problem with both Obamacare and Dodd-Frank is that it has uh, seemed to be amazingly hard to get people to understand the thinking behind both of them, why they look the way they do. And I'd like to hear your take on what, what it was you were trying to do with, with that reform. What was the structure? I think the best way to answer that is to do a brief tour of economic history. I think the fact is we are a, an economy in which the private sector is the driver and the innovator, and that's a good thing. The role of the public sector is to maintain a set of rules that in the optimum give you the best of what the private sector does and minimize negative effects. Every so often, periods of maybe over decades, the innovation in the private sector reaches a kind of critical mass and outstrips existing regulation so that you had that growth of national businesses from 1850 till 1900, and you had that burst of economic activity around the turn of the 20th century to create national economic regulation. Then you had the New Deal because that led to a finance capitalism regime and there were no regulations for stock markets. And so that's what happened then. That remarkable achievement, and Roosevelt should get a lot of credit for that, his people, what they did beginning in the early 30s and ending in just before World War II with the Investment Company Acts, 
created a structure that, that served us very well until into the 80s. And then came major innovations from the 80s. Uh, essentially, the biggest change was um, what happened to lending. 60 years ago, most loans, most people borrowed money from the people they were going to pay back. And you had then a lot of money that came in from outside the banking system. And you had what was an absolute essential for this, information technology. Because you couldn't have had credit default swaps and securitization of mortgages and mortgage-backed securities without the information technology. But what happened was by the end of the 20th century, there was a system that had outstripped the regulation. The regulation was based on an older model, basically of banks lending people money, and that had been totally displaced, lending people money and getting paid back. So what we, what we believed we were doing was to look at the way the economy and particularly the financial system had evolved and come up with new rules. So for example, we thought we needed to replace the discipline that came in the lending business when people lent money to the people they expected to pay them back. When, it was no, when the connection between the lender and the borrower's ability to repay was severed, we tried to replace that. The single biggest addition of power that we gave was to a couple of entities to deal with this, the financial derivatives, which didn't exist before. And uh, uh, that we, we empowered people to deal with those. So, uh, by the way, some people uh, on our left were unhappy because it was a pretty much market-oriented operation. Our biggest response to the question of derivatives was to try to get them on exchanges. And uh, with regard to uh, lending, I thought the best thing was what we call risk retention, which is to say that if you're going to take over and sell those things, you take the first X percent of the loss, which gives you the incentive to deal with that. But that's essentially what we thought we were doing, was uh, imposing rules for a new set of financial activities which had outgrown the old rules. So, so for, for, the, for people who are not following this, you know, derivatives are you know, fairly complicated financial contracts that are not easily summarized, but, but are supposed to spread risk, but can actually end up creating risk, and, and were played a, a very big role in the financial system. You know, what Warren Buffett called weapons of financial mass destruction, because yeah. the key piece is that they, they, uh, a fairly small amount of money gets transmogrified into very large amounts of money. And the, the best example of this was AIG and was making so much money in the insurance business that they literally had more money than they knew what to do with, quite literally. So they went into this business of selling what is cleverly called credit default swaps, which has no obvious meaning, but it's a way to sell insurance without having the kind of resources to back up your obligations that everybody who sells life insurance and uh, casualty insurance, et cetera, has to have. And AIG basically sold people who had bought securities based on mortgages policies that said if you're, in effect, if the mortgages start not paying off and so the security fails, we will make you good. And they did that with no understanding of what was involved in the packages and with no money to back it up. So, and this is the, the best single thing of, uh, to, to kind of summarize it. In September of 2008, AIG went to Ben Bernanke and said, we're $85 billion short of being able to pay off what we owe to people who bought our credit default swaps. Lehman Brothers having just collapsed a couple of days before, the Bush administration, by the way, there were five bailouts. I don't say this critically of them. I work with them on some. But there were five bailouts in recent times, all five initiated by George W. Bush. And we have a real problem with the, with, the, with the misunderstanding of how these things happen. But Bernanke then used existing authority under the Federal Reserve to advance $85 billion to pay off the debts that AIG had so it didn't cause everybody else to stop lending money to anybody else. A week later, and I'll end with this, when he and Paulson, the Secretary of Treasury, were telling us how much money they were going to need to deal with things, and Bernanke said, and $85 billion for AIG, and we, the members of Congress, said, oh, no, you already told us that. He said, no, I'm sorry, that's an additional $85 billion. AIG, these great financial experts who later sued the federal government for treating them rudely, um, not only were they in debt ultimately $170 billion beyond what they could pay, but they didn't even know it. 
uh, one week they thought they owed 85, the next week it was, whoops, 170. And that's the power of the derivatives of the, of the leverage. They're the ones that later sued the federal government uh, because they said they were not treated fairly. So the, the, uh, so the, you, you think that the, or your, your view is that the regulation of derivatives, uh, basically uh, trying to prevent another rogue operation like this from happening is, is, is the most important piece of the... It was the biggest new element in, in what we did. Um, equally important, we, clearly the single biggest mistake in the, uh, in, in the period leading up to the crash were, were profligate loans made to very low-income people who couldn't pay them back. And another myth is, oh, that was the liberals. In fact, beginning in 1994, consistently until we took power in 2007, liberal Democrats tried to restrain that kind of lending, in part as a protection for the people who are taking the loans. And very critically, Alan Greenspan, in his 2007 memoir, said, obviously before we knew how bad things were, at least before he knew, um, he said, Yes, there is a high risk that loans of this sort will not be repaid adequately, but the risk is worth taking because you cannot have a capitalist system without strong public support for property rights. And lending these people money to buy homes creates political support for property rights. Um, but so we did just the one thing we do in there that deals with restricts lending is essentially to say, you really can't lend money to people who have very little chance of paying you back. But beyond that, we did, there were just no regulations of financial derivatives. And uh, what we did was to try to say, first of all, that you could not incur these obligations as AIG did without having some requirement that you have some money to, to, to pay them off, both as the institution as a whole and transaction by transaction, and also that they should have to go in, into a market mechanism where it was possible. I think something like 80% of them, close to 80% of them are now being done that way. But that was the biggest grant of, of new authority. Part of the problem was, by the way, that when the Republicans took office the next year, because they've already begun attacking this, the agency that got the greatest grant of new power, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, two former chairs of whom, Jim Stone and Gary Gensler, are sitting in front, uh, they were starved by the Republicans. I think the total budget, Gary, what's the last budget of the CFTC? Yeah, this is an agency that is in charge, has, has a primary responsibility for regulating the, what, trillions of dollars nominally that's at risk with, uh, with, with financial derivatives, and the Republicans have given it a total budget of $250 million, million with an M. Um, oh, um, actually, I. I'm going to get diverted because I, I, I'm, I'm learning something. How, how well do you think the derivatives, I mean, it's the CFTC is star, but how well do you think the regulation is going? I mean, how, are, are derivatives substantially more under control now than they were? I believe they are. I have, to be honest with you, I got on the committee that I ultimately chaired because I had a jurisdiction over housing. And I most cared about trying to build affordable housing, rental housing. I've always thought that we have undervalued rental housing and overemphasize home ownership, and that's a serious problem. And then I got into fighting with, frankly, some of the Clinton administration people about the uh, rules for the IMF and the World Bank and whether or not they, countries, I believe countries should be allowed to impose capital controls. They thought they shouldn't. Um, the committee I served on even had jurisdiction over derivatives and securities until 2003. So I didn't know a lot about them. And, um, I had to learn something about them, but I will be honest with you, it has not been one of the subjects which I have felt compelled to stay abreast of, of which I have compelled to stay abreast. I believe there's been substantial improvement. The one thing I would say, let me just, here's, here's what I will, uh, <clears throat> um, because the derivatives has to do with uh, uh, trading. And the, here, Deutsche Bank, they'll have to accelerate cost cutting this is the Wall Street Journal. Conditions have worsened, making profits harder to achieve. The retrenchments reflect banks coming to grips with tougher capital requirements. The rules are driving firms to get more efficient in trading so they can try to make more money while taking less risk. And uh, it also says about Goldman Sachs that uh, because uh, um, the rules, the new rules, make it harder to make money in trading 
they've gone into the lending business. Interesting because the Trump people, their argument is we have to do away with financial regulation because it's impeding lending. In fact, it's done very little to lending. What it's done is impede trading, but they know that that's harder to defend. So there's clearly been significant improvement. Uh, the extent to which it's happened, I'd be honest, I just I'm not, I haven't kept up with. Okay, um, it's been a substantial increase also in, in capitalization, right? That leverage uh, it is way down. So it, that's one right, of the right, and they do have and and the derivatives previously, the financial derivatives were. Uh, one-on-one -on -one transactions to a great extent, over the counter. Right. Um, there is a significant movement, uh, and you know, Gary could both be able to talk about this more because he was there supervising some of it, to force them into exchanges, into clearinghouses where, where, where it's no longer one-on-one. -on -one. And, and the likelihood, well, I, I do think this, I think the likelihood that an AIG could incur $170 billion in obligations in financial derivatives and not have the money to pay for it has been substantially diminished by a variety of requirements. Yeah, th this is, a, again, for people who are not into this stuff, uh, um, which I wasn't, I mean, I have to say, by, by the way, one of the things about the, uh, I'm glad to hear even Barney saying that he didn't know about the all the, you know, it wasn't, uh, I, I was, when, when, when stuff started to come apart at the seams, I discovered that how, how ignorant I was of, of, of what was really going on in the financial world. And, you know, I, the idea that AIG was even, a player in, in the regular financial system, let alone that it could threaten to you know, bring down uh, the Western world, was, was really a, a shock. Um, but, um, the, uh, but the amazing thing about derivatives, to some extent even now, but much, much less than before the law, uh, was, is that there, we're not talking about things where there are markets. We weren't talking about things where there are markets. There was some guy in the London office of AIG who you would get on the phone and he'd say, I'll come and make a deal, here's what we're gonna do. And you would really, the people making that deal would have no idea um, how that compared, what, what the price on, such, on similar deals was like, what you were getting into, and of course no idea how many other deals just like it AIG was making, so you had no way of knowing whether they were in any position to honor the, um, the claims that, you know, to, to honor the promises they were making, which it turned out they weren't remotely in a position to do. And, and they ignored improved. the underlying asset for all this were these mortgages that were no good. Right. And uh, what they, they, nobody ever checked them. And the, one, what the entity they relied on, if people have seen, better read the book, The Big Short, they were told by the rating agencies that these were good, some of them. And I gotta say, one of the things, of all the people's incompetence, the rating agencies, these very important entities that gave ratings to securities as to how good they would be paid off, it is very clear. They simply were making things up. I mean, they weren't wrong. They weren't making misjudgments. They were just making crap up. Uh, and here's, here's, I guess, what I, I most recent clip. Mr. Blankfein, the head of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, led Goldman through the financial crisis and has had to guide it through the raft of new regulations introduced since then, which have limited the firm's ability to make big profits from trading. Over the last... <coughs> Over the last year, Mr. Blankfein has put more of an emphasis on the company's technology powers and has built up a new division to offer financial services to ordinary Americans, including Marcus, an online lending service. Apparently, Goldman's first name was Marcus, the original Goldman, true. Um, that work, though, has been slow going, and it may become less necessary if Mr. Trump's administration eases the restrictions on Wall Street firms. Goldman stock has, of course, gone way up, way more than the broad market. So, yeah, F Goldman has had to start cutting down. They're not making as much money on trading because of, of these restrictions. By the way, factoid, um, I, I was looking. Um, uh, st people say stocks are up since, since the election, which they are, but it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, uh, Non-financials are up 1% since the day before the election. Financial stocks are up 14%. Uh, and Goldman, according to this, 23. 25, Goldman, 23. Uh, well, that's because they, they, we've had a renewal of the, of the law which says that every eight years there has to be a, a, a Treasury Secretary for Treasury. Goldman. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, all right, so derivatives, um, uh, gosh, I, 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 I'm at, at risk of, of wandering down my own pathways. Um, uh, you want to say just a word about uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is Elizabeth Warren's baby? Yeah, one of the things we did, and it was Senator Warren's idea, um, 
Consumer protection. The bill did not so much create new consumer protections as consolidate enforcement. Consumer protection in the financial area was divided up among the agencies whose job it was to regulate and protect the, the health of the banks. The single agency that had the largest share of consumer protection laws to administer was the Federal Reserve System. Um, and frankly, if you are the control of the currency, the head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and certainly the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, you are worried about the whole economy, you're worried about the health of the banks. An old woman somewhere who gets knocked down $170 from her account doesn't rise to your level of interest. So what we did was to take every consumer protection law involving financial activity and put it into a new entity called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has worked very, very well. You hear complaints from a lot of the Republicans and some of the institutions about it. You have not read one example of abuse by them. And in fact, we were able to do one thing, which I, I've always, you know, one of the problems in, in, in real life government is you can't do experiments because you cannot consciously do less than what you should, could do. But there was an experiment that, that resulted from the one major political loss I suffered on the Consumer Bureau. There was one area in consumer finance today that is making people nervous. It's automobiles. You will read about there are problems with auto loans. The auto dealers are very popular people in their own districts. You've all seen their high Hawaii commercials, you know, it's Friendly Joe and Easy Al, and they sponsor the Little League and the members of Rotary, and everybody loves the auto dealers and loves to laugh with them. And they got an amendment put through, the one vote I lost in my committee that I really cared about, which exempted automobile dealers from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. There is zero logic to it. No, they should mention that more often when they write those stories. There is zero logic to it. By the way, there's one, one other factor. The auto industry has apparently done a better job than m almost any other industry in America in f uh, giving franchises to members of minority groups, particularly African Americans. Because when the vote came on this, the African American members of the committee who were usually, not usually, in every other issue, unyielding supporters of tough regulation, some of them voted to exempt the auto industry because they had African American auto dealers in their districts calling them saying, hey, these are the only guys who put us in business. You gotta go with them. So, but the, 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 we have a real experiment here, a real time actual experiment. The one area of consumer lending that is exempt from enforcement by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is the one area of consumer lending where we have problems today, both macro and micro because we, we have both unfairness to individuals, and this is the thing about consumer protection, you're out there to protect individual consumers, but when a couple of million individual consumers get screwed, then you've got a macroeconomic problem. And, and I, people should really be, be studying the auto industry, as you, this is the auto sales from that standpoint. Okay, um, gee. If, uh, alternatively, we could, we could try to deal with excessive trust of, of the, the uh, auto dealers by making people watch Fargo. The, uh, the old movie, but anyway, uh, the uh, um, last, last uh, piece of Dodd-Frank I want to talk about, um, there, there, I, I thought, and maybe I've been wrong, I, I always played a, a lot of attention to the SIFI, the uh, uh, strategically uh, important financial institution, uh, systemically important, sorry, um, I always get that mixed up, uh, systemically important financial institution. Can, you want to talk about that a little bit? Because I, I, I think it's an interesting story of how this happened. I, I'm a, I have a little hobby of semantics, by the way. SIFI, S-I-F-I, stands for Systemically Important Financial Institutions. Side point, by the rules of English pronunciation, which do exist, although they're a little weird, S-I-F-I, generally in English, if the continent is single, the vowel is long. If the continent is double, the vowel is short. It is jiffy. Um, so S-I-F-I should not be pronounced siffy, but sci-fi was already taken. Yeah, uh, that's exactly. True. That's exactly, that's why, that's why they're close. Well, here was the, th this was something which really came out of the Bush administration. In 2008, Lehman Brothers failed. 
and couldn't pay its debts. And for a variety of reasons, nothing was done to resolve those. The people who were owed money by Lehman Brothers were left hanging. And in the judgment of the Bush administration, the result of that was a, a near freeze of the economy. Nobody would lend any money to anybody because of this fear that there wouldn't be repayment. So when two days later, AIG came in, first with the 85 to become 170, the Bush administration then said, oh geez, we can't let this happen again. Um, we're gonna have to pay it off. By the way, there had been a strong argument from some of the Republicans who said, we believe in free enterprise, no bailouts, you don't step in, you let it happen. And then Lehman Brothers happened, and the result was a freeze in the economy. I announced at the time that I was gonna file a bill designating the day that Lehman Brothers failed as free enterprise day, because it was the one day that we had free enterprise, because by the next day, all those free enterprises were ready to, to have some intervention. But, so here's what the uh, Paulson and Bernanke, the Bush people said was, look, under the law, before we passed our bill, they had two choices. If, if a major institution, the reason it's systemically important is this, it's not the size of the institution, it's the size of the indebtedness that it cannot meet, because it is unrepaid debts that become the problem. So they had a choice. Either they got to go bankrupt and paid none of the debts, or they bailed it out and paid all the debts. So what we did was to create, and it's somewhat controversial among people as to whether it will work, but we have a, a power now that says, if an institution whose indebtedness would threaten the stability of the system if it weren't dealt with, the federal government will step in, but it will not do what it did with AIG, which is to pay their debts and keep them in business. The institution is taken over. It is, it is dissolved, except by a strange semantic thing that's called resolved in financial issues. But when you resolve a bank, you blow it up. So that you, the institution is dissolved. The federal government is then empowered under bankruptcy powers to pay only some of the debts, not all of the debts. You know, in bankruptcy, you can get a percentage. And if they have to pay debts, if there's federal money that has to be advanced to pay those debts, the Secretary of the Treasury is required under law to recover any tax outlay from the other financial institutions. And, but so as you try to avoid that, there, we, we, we gathered all the existing financial regulatory authorities in one. I was at a session today with Paul Volcker, we were talking about it. It would have been better to rationalize that. But the problem is that the, the existing complex federal regulatory structure represents political vested interests, and we were trying to make substantive changes in the law. We didn't have the political strength to do that and make the regulatory rationalization. But we created the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC, which is all these regulators. And they are empowered. There were, what, there were eight, now it's down to seven entities that were deemed big enough so that if they couldn't pay their debts, they would destabilize the system. And they are subjected to additional scrutiny from the, uh, f from the uh, uh, Financial Stability Oversight Council and if one of them does fail, despite being told to fix this up and do that and get better here, they, they are then taken over, dissolved, and uh, that's, that's the uh, result. I need to s just make an administrative announcement. You should have cards to write questions on, and uh, it, you might want to start doing that now, and eventually people will come down by the sides to, to collect the questions. We're going we're to do it on, uh, by, by the card system. Do we have cards out there, I hope? Yeah, okay. And can I say, because uh, I know this is, and the question is, you know, are they too big? Or not? One argument is, well, they're still too big to fail. So the way to deal with that, one argument is the way to deal, how do you deal with the situation of a, of a financial institution, not just a bank, being so big that it can get so indebted and that if it can't be paid, it causes a problem. One argument is, well, you, you reduce them so no entity is too big to fail. Problem with how you do that, Lehman Brothers failure was the one that touched that off. So if you believe that the way to deal with this is simply to make sure that no institution is large enough so that its indebtedness could be a systemic threat, then presumably no institution could be as much as 95% as big as Lehman Brothers because you need some margin of error. And I, I don't know how you, how you get that and I think it could be very uh, destabilizing. So our focus was not on the size of the institution per se, but on the size of the indebtedness. Although one of the things the Financial Stability Oversight Council is empowered to do is to look institution by institution and say, you know what, we've, 
you're too big and too complicated, and you have to divest this and you have to divest that. But again, the, the focus is not simply on the size of the institution. Canada has, what, five very big banks, but the way they are regulated, that nobody's worried about it. So the, the focus is on trying to prevent them from getting so indebted rather than simply on their size overall. Okay, uh, just uh, my, my small interjection there. Part of the point about the whole SIFI, FSOC uh, thing is that it, it's much hard. It, in the 30s, they had a relatively easy task because we knew what a bank was. It was a big marble building with a, with a bunch of tellers and, and the, the trouble has been now we have all these institutions which are complicated and we don't, and so this is a way of dealing and with. International. And international. And international. And so this is a way of, of, of providing a, a sort of discretionary mechanism uh, to, to, to deal with, since you couldn't, we can't define. And, you know, just to, if people aren't feeling bad, maybe I'll make them, but Hillary Clinton had made it clear with uh, the advice of, among others, I believe, Gary Gensler, who had been deeply involved in both the writing of the legislation and administering it, that she was fully aware of the powers that exist in the existing law for this Financial Stability Oversight Council to begin to simplify some of the larger institutions and having, they have to do these living wills and at some point the uh, regulators would be empowered and still are, I don't know if I get used, to say to institution X or Y, we don't believe you have the ability to control what you're doing and you're too risky and you have to spin this off or scale that back. Um, yeah, I, I used to, uh, uh, I, I guess I'll want to talk in a minute about, about what you might have done differently, weaknesses in the law, but uh, I used to say that, that the, the whole uh, FSOC thing was, was very, very smart in way of dealing with it, but it depended upon having reasonably, reasonable and reasonably smart people uh, on, the, the, on, on the financial stability oversight. Uh, and that I, I used to you know, make jokes at, uh, proposing uh, highly unsuitable people that some hypothetical future administration might appoint, and now now those all look like like you know uh, wildly optimistic cases. Uh, yeah, can I just say on that again? I spent because Paul Volcker is uh, doing a report on stuff, and um, he's worried in part about the uh, we set up these clearing houses that are the ones that consolidate and make sure that the. The clearing houses are for individual derivatives, so they have to be cleared in ways that make it le much less likely that there will be individual defaults. It makes a reasonable point that those might then be a problem. We have to do a better job of looking at how those are governed. But he was also arguing we have a very complex number of regulators. Ideally, we would have reduced the number of regulators. There are two regulators of derivatives, the Securities Exchange Commission and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. It makes no sense whatsoever except that when it started, the CFTC, it, they had actual commodities. Um, we didn't have credit default swaps and things back then. They are now the, the, the agriculture community regards that as their agency, the SEC is different. So politically consolidating some of these agencies was too hard. The FSOC is in that way to some extent second best. Rather than consolidate the agencies, they all do sit together, and everybody involved believes this is a significant improvement, and they also have some power to act together. To, to the, the FSOC can in some cases, because you always have the problem of what's called regulatory capture, where the regulators of a particular industry become too friendly. The FSOC does have the power to order the primary regulator in any one case uh, to, to do it differently, or at least strongly nudge them. And I guess with regard to money market mutual funds, the FSOC did say to the uh, SEC, you're being too weak on them, and did, did pressure them to be tougher. Uh, sorry, are we being asked to... Okay, if people can pass cards to the sides, I guess they, will, they can collect them, thanks. Um, yeah, I, actually, one of the revelations uh, of, of all of this stuff you're describing, I'm, I'm learning quite a lot, actually, as we speak, is, is just how important the, um, the, the simple sort of bureaucratic logic of, of an agency reflecting sort of its primary constituents and, and simply taking functions uh, out from, from, uh, from an agency where they end up being uh, uh, you know, handled by somebody who doesn't have them as a primary focus can make a huge difference. That's consumer protection and it's, it's true, uh, you're saying basically the FSOC can, can tell agencies not to follow their natural predilections. 
No, absolutely right. In, 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 in both cases, I mean, the FSOC, it, it does be create a sort of collective overall regulator. It also has this. One of the problems is it, it, it deals with the situation where a particular activity might not fit neatly into one of the regulator's jurisdictions. They've right. got an overall ability to sit down and say, okay, um, how do we deal with it? And the Consumer Bureau, again, I, um, I, and I know I, on this one, um, I understand there are people in the administration. By the way, of all the things that we have, that's the one that many of the financial institutions hate the worst. Um, we are talking here, you may, so you'll remember, it was the Consumer Bureau that put a stop to Wells Fargo's creating false that's right. credit cards. It, the Consumer Bureau did that. And uh, if they go after the Consumer Bureau, I think they're making a big political mistake. But uh, uh, the, the Consumer Bureau is one of the great successes. And, you know, go write in a paper. Go, go look at this. Um, they hate it. And they have not been able to come up with any horribles. They talk about how it's structurally unwise, but uh, there is literally no example. In fact, and they used to complain there wasn't enough oversight because Congress doesn't get to appropriate it. Right, we didn't let that be subject to appropriation because we didn't want it to be like the CFTC and the SEC, which are starved. So the agency dealing with theoretically trillions of dollars of the most complex financial instruments in the history of the world has a budget of $250 million to, to, to deal with it, which includes personnel and IT uh, and, and, and everything else. So uh, the, the, I just urge people, go look and you will not find any, even a serious allegation that the Consumer Bureau was abusive or unfair or inaccurate in any of its activities. Yeah, and it happens because the uh, great virtue of, of it's quite easy to understand what it does, which I think in some of the rest of it, it's actually a little bit hard to explain. Yeah, and as to I said too, and it, it is aimed at protecting consumers, but I want to say again that this is one where, you know, quantity can become quality. If enough consumers are put in difficult situations, like with the mortgages, it can accumulate to do a serious damage to the economy, and that's that's the fear. It does, you know, automobiles are not as important in people's lives economically as houses. But you're now reading, you're seeing this, the, the exemption of the auto industry over our, my objection by the votes of uh, all the Republicans and some of the Democrats has not only created consumer issues, individual issues in the auto industry, but it's the one area in consumer finance where there is a current fear that there could be something broader in its impact, although not, nothing like the mortgage crisis. Uh, yeah, actually, that, that was one of the questions uh, that I was going to ask. If Do, do you have, I mean, I, I know, uh, almost by definition, the next crisis is unforecastable, but do you have any visions of, of what might happen, especially if, if we have a dismantling of, of, uh, of significant provisions? Well, there are a couple of things. One, there was some concern now about you know, what we didn't get done, and obviously there were, there, there were limits. I mean, we needed 60 votes in the Senate. We understand we had a little bit of a margin in the House, but we had, we had no, not one vote to spare in the Senate. Um, you needed 60 votes. There were three Republicans who voted for the bill in the Senate, uh, Brown of Massachusetts, Collins and Snow of Maine. They agreed that they would all stick together. So if we had lost them, then we lost the bill. You know, I mean, we had one extra, but, but it wasn't really because there were three together. So we didn't have the power to do any, the votes to do any more. There is concern about uh, some of the, and I'm, I, I'll tell you what it is, somebody else can have to explain, the, the tri-party, the repos, the, the yeah. practice of financial institutions lending each other money and getting repaid right back in that. The, the, there is some concern that that could get out of hand. Tim Geithner was worried about that, uh, and others were. There is concern too about some of the financial activity that is takes place outside of the uh, normal institutions. Um, I, the, the big issue we have is this, and here's where people are most skeptical, I think, of the bill. I disagree with them. If an inst we, we do try very hard to prevent institutions from accumulating debt beyond what they can pay off in a variety of ways. But if an institution does come up and say, I'm sorry, I can't pay my debts, what happens? 
Uh, and then the other one is, what happens if it's not just one institution, but if it's several? Uh, how do you deal with that? And there are some, by the way, including Tim Geithner and some others, who believe that we went too far in restricting the ability of the Federal Reserve to step in. We took away the power the Federal Reserve used in 2008 to pay off the debts of AIG. And some say, oh no, look, as much as you hate it, you're gonna have to have that. Simon Johnson said it today. Uh, the answer is, the American people today are in no mood for that. It just couldn't happen. So if you got that kind of a multiple crash, you'd have to have an ad hoc response. But that, that's the other concern I hear is that, well, it's not gonna work. And if somebody does collapse, well, let's say if Citicorp or uh, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, if one of them was to be in that situation, there was no reason to think any of them are close to it right now, politically, they would not be, you wouldn't put them out of business. You'd step in and bail them out. I think that is absolutely wrong uh, because people are in the mood to shoot everybody now. But that's the other concern we hear. Okay, so, so you're, what you're saying is that, in, in, actually, I was going to ask that, is what you would have done differently if you could have. And, and, um, but you're saying that, that one, that rather oddly, the, the law, the, the Dodd-Frank may have, have um, uh, in a way, done too much in terms of, of restricting the ability to yeah, be flexible. I don't think flexible. so, but this but, is what, yeah. Okay. What I would have done, the major thing I would have done differently, by the way, even before the law, I, we, we passed what's known as the TARP, uh, which lent the money to the banks. We made money on that. Every, all the money that was lent out on the TARP was paid back with interest, except for the auto bailout, which was funded out of that, and we lost money on that, and I'm glad we did. That was very important to do. Um, we had, in the Democratic Congress, in passing that, gave the administration, the Bush administration, which ran it, the authority to help people who were facing foreclosure, some of whom were been unfairly treated, some of whom, people who bought a house and it went way up in, in value and they took out a second loan and bought a boat, were not objects of my sympathy. But there are a lot of people who, who were hurt. But Paulson refused to use any of the first money for relief of foreclosures because he felt he had an urgency to use the money for other purposes. The, the money was voted, it, it could be voted in two tranches. He got 350 billion, he spent all of that on the, uh, on the banks. We, that, we were complaining, but he was in power. So he finally said, okay, this is like in December. One of the most interesting things that hadn't gotten enough study is that the resolution, the response to the crisis came during a presidential transition. Yeah. And Paulson did agree that he would ask Congress for the second 350 billion and use a lot of it for foreclosure relief if the Obama administration, the incoming administration, said he should do it. He said, I'm going out of office. I'm not gonna do something that, of that magnitude with a month to go. The Obama administration, like the Roosevelt administration 80 years before, responded, no, look, they're in power until January 20th. We are not gonna ask them, we're not gonna ask that they get the authority to spend money that we have no control over. We're not gonna be responsible for what they do. They're in charge, let them ask. Paulson said, oh no, I can't do that because, right. uh, it, you know, and finally, the Obama people's response was, well, because I was begging the Obama people to do it, because I wanted to do something about foreclosures, and the Obama response was, well, we only have one president at a time. And my response to that was that they had overstated the number of presidents we had at that particular uh, time. <laughs> wow. All right, let me ask one more question and then we'll try to throw it open for the, the, uh, the question for the audience. Um, what do you think happens uh, now? I mean, I, I, had, I, I was in, in a, I, I was, well, I, I found myself sharing a, a stage with Glenn Hubbard, uh, who is not, you know, he and I don't agree about a lot of things, but, um, but seemed almost as horrified uh, by, the, by the new group as I was. But he, he, was, he was saying that he, he thought that, that, um, that Dodd-Frank would be much more durable than people think Who's because Glenn Hubbard, Okay. Uh, um, and uh, the uh, that basically that Wall, Wall Street has built itself, rebuilt itself around the law. And I don't. But what do you think? Do you think they'll just sc scrap the whole thing? I, I don't think they can scrap the whole thing. Here's what I. First of all, I uh, if they want to go after the consumer bill, I welcome that. Nothing is going to be a better way for us to dramatize what I think is a great gap 
between a campaign that said, I'm going to take care of the working guy and stand up to the big guys, and then dismantling the most effective protection the average citizen has ever had in this area. Beyond that, I take, I, when I'm in a debate and my opponents are being dishonest, I'm encouraged because it, I, I know that means that they're, gonna, the, 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 they're in trouble with the truth. I, I, one of my favorite descriptions of this is from La Rochefoucauld. Hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue. When people are being hypocritical, it's because they know if they told the truth, they might be in some trouble. And here's what gives me heart. The arguments that I am reading now about the need to substantially undo the uh, financial reform bill, it is that it is impeding lending, and this is bad for the economy because we want banks to lend. In fact, the bill does very little to impede lending. It does impede lending to people who can't pay back their home mortgages. And it does say that if you're gonna be the securitizer of loans, you have to pay the first percentage of the loss, but the regulators, to my dismay, exempted home mortgages. So there's very little in there that affects lending. The bill has much more of an impact in restricting trading. That's why I was struck when I read this, this clipping. Goldman Sachs is reducing its trading activities and trying to build up its profitability by getting into the lending business. One of the symbols that they, they want to get rid of is the Volcker Rule. The Volcker Rule says that if you are a bank, a traditional bank, taking deposits, federal deposit insurance, etc., you should not be in the derivative business on your own account. You should not spend a lot of your time trading. In other words, the Volcker Rule says to banks, stop trading and lend more. So in the interest, theoretically, of protecting lending, they want to repeal the law that tells the banks to lend and not trade. And I, I'm, that can be complicated to get across, but I'm, I'm hoping we can. There is this. I, there are two groups that have political clout and a reasonable argument. We set the level at which you become a SIFI and go into the Financial Stability Oversight Council at 50 billion. I now believe that was too low. I don't think, and, and it's also, we should have indexed it even if we'd set it at 50 billion. I would support putting that up to 100 or 125 with the right of the regulators to reach back and say, all right, you're only 87, but you're, you're, you, you need to come in here. Um, uh, by the way, that cannot be the cause. The, the fact that banks that are too small are in the FSOC cannot be the cause of any lending problem, because I checked with the Treasury Department today, Antonio Weiss, and exactly one bank has made the transition. So it's kind of hard to argue that it's something which hasn't yet affected more than just one bank, not even a bank holding company, does it. The other issue is this. Some of the smaller banks, I do believe, they're complaining, the community banks, which have the most political clout. Banks under 10 billion is what we said. And uh, uh, for instance, a lot of them are spending a lot of money in compliance with the Volcker Rule. They're not affected by it. They don't do derivatives. But I, and I'm convinced of this, and I've talked to some of the lawyers, they are being over-lawyered. The lawyers are telling them to spend a lot more time and energy showing that they are in compliance. They're not. And some lawyers have said to me, yeah, we're worried about malpractice. So there was a proposal in 2013 from Dan Tarullo over the Federal Reserve, exempt banks under 10 billion from some of these rules, just flat out exempt them so they don't have to spend a lot of money saying they're complying, and move the 50 up to 125. What I'm afraid of is, with the tactic of the people who really want to protect credit default swaps and, and massive trading, will be to put them all in one bill. And my advice to the Democrats is, take those two things, exempting people under 10 billion, and moving the 50 up to say 125, I put them in a separate bill and, and, and then tell these people, look, if they put it into a broader thing, we're gonna have to filibuster it. Um, given that, I think they're gonna have a really hard time uh, politically. Unlike Obamacare, where they can use the reconciliation mechanism for some 51 votes, they need 60 votes to do this. And I don't believe they have uh, uh, that many Democratic senators, eight Democratic senators, prepared to, to, to retreat on this. I think this is still very popular. And the fact that they have to misdescribe what they are trying to do. They are trying to restore the freedom to do derivative trades. And they are falsely describing that as an ability to release lending from non-existing constraints. Gives me some confidence. Okay. Let me uh, give you a few uh, audience-generated questions. Uh, one, uh, 
with, uh, which I believe actually came, anyway, the, uh, uh, it, it is, a, at least for some people, a hot button issue. Why, why do you think there were no criminal charges filed in all of this? Yeah, um, I'm not sure. Um, part of it was that some of the bad stuff wasn't illegal. Some of it clearly was, like lying about uh, LIBOR. Um, part of it is, in fairness, you know, the, it's hard to get jurors convinced. Uh, you know, they lost some cases, particularly in insider trading and, and, and in a few others. Um, there may have been some, some fear that uh, if you went after people criminally, it might cause an institutional collapse. I, I've got, look, it does seem to me, finding the institution is a very mixed blessing because you're penalizing the stockholders who are already penalized. So I wanted there to be uh, criminal charges. I will say just in my own defense, given congressional jurisdiction, we had no criminal authority to make things criminal for the different committee. Um, but I'm puzzled by that. I wish they had brought some. Um, I, I, I have not gotten myself a full explanation. I would say, though, to some of my fellow liberals, let's be clear again, and this may be the major reason why there weren't a lot of them. These were fairly sophisticated abuses. In many cases, it was a failure to inform. It was not so much the affirmative doing, but uh, maybe the failure to do some things. We have always believed strongly in due process in criminal justice. A central tenet of due process is that someone charged with a crime has to have had a very clear understanding of what was illegal. It doesn't contradict ignorance, there's no excuse. It had to be that there was a legal doctrine, if you went and found it, that made clear that what you were doing was criminal. And there wasn't a lot of that. And I, that I, to some extent, I think it may have been a scrupulousness on the part of some of the prosecutors because the law was full of ambiguities and, uh, and fairness. Having said all that, I was also disappointed that they didn't get any criminal prosecutions. Yeah, that's... Uh, I guess that's the last point is this. The way it worked and the way these things were structured, it was probably impossible to get criminal prosecutions at the very top level. There was just too much ambiguity and too much insulation. And then the question is, do you go and throw the guy six levels down in prison when the top guys uh, skate? Yeah. Um, there's a question, actually this is something we, you and I both sort of failed to, uh, to address and it's a good question for the audience. Um, you know, th there, there's this claim uh, by Republicans that, that, uh, that, uh, that Dodd-Frank and actually specifically the SIFI process, that it institutionalizes too big to fail. Uh, and the question, um, which probably it, some of us may tend to think is obvious, but you know, why not simply let a financial institution fail? Well, I, I would say, first of all, in terms of institutionalizing too big to fail, what we say under the law, I insist, is there are no longer institutions that are too big to fail. Because if an institution presents itself, or we see an institution that cannot pay its debts, it fails. Its debts may be paid, but it fails. And I had one of the, uh, who Adam Posen say, well, they'll resist, they, they won't agree to that. It's not up to them. Under the law, if, if AIG, if there was a repeat of AIG, AIG would have been put out of business without AIG's uh, agreeing to it. So again, the institution will fail, the feds will step in and pay some of the debts and try to keep some parts of it working. That's one of the reasons they're having these living wills is to say, okay, if the overall institution fails, are there particular parts of it that can be kept alive? Can you keep them uh, functioning? But the reason is very simple, and this is Lehman Brothers. And I, I just, th that was an argument that said, let them fail. And it was strongly argued by a lot of the Republicans. And uh, in 2008, over that weekend, uh, Hank Paulson, who was the Bush Secretary of the Treasury, whom I had a great deal of respect for, um, tried very hard not to have Lehman Brothers fail. There were people who said, oh, he decided to let it go because of political heat. The problem was he had run out of banks to take it over. Bank of America had taken over Merrill Lynch. 
J.P. Morgan Chase had taken over Bear Stearns. Wells Fargo had taken over Wachovia. There was nobody left uh, to take over um, uh, uh, Lehman Brothers. So we tried to get Barclays Bank to do it, and the British regulators said, no, sir, we don't need that over here. So it failed. And the reason is that it was the judgment of all the people who spent a lot of time thinking about this, that the reaction to Lehman Brothers not paying its debt, debts was toxic, that it led to a situation where nobody was going to lend to anybody else, and uh, it was worldwide. So when Lehman Brothers fails, you have banks all over the world not paying, because so much of what's going on in the financial world, these repos, these day, day, you know, overnight repayments, yeah. that, that's the argument, that uh, if you, it, it's not that the institution fails, it is the failure of the institution that's large enough that it's, it's a failure to pay a very large amount of debt and the contagion that that causes in the economy. Yeah, I, I saw, I'll just throw my, the, what, we, what we saw in you know, those, those terrifying few weeks there in, in 2008 was the 21st century version of a, of a bank run. Uh, of a, of, it, it mostly took place not with you know, lines of people outside actual banks, but instead of people demanding larger haircuts on repo, which, which basically, but it had the same effect. It meant that credit froze. It meant that, they, that the gears of the economy sort of ground to a stop. And the trouble with banks is that, you, that, that they are different. It's, it's, uh, when, when, when banks start to fail, the whole engine starts to uh, come apart. And, and remember, what we tried hard to do was to make it much less likely that yeah. this would happen. I mean, but we begin, now you don't know what the next cause is, but it's clearly the single biggest part of the problem previously was a whole lot of bad mortgage loans made. That, that won't happen again. So there may be some other kind of, uh, of bad loans. And then we try to do other things to stop it. But that, that was the sense that when, it was based on the rea of what happened when Lehman Brothers failed and the feeling that, so then the next one was AIG and their conviction was Lehman Brothers having failed on Monday, if AIG had failed on, on Wednesday, you would have had the, the worldwide economy grinding down to a halt. Yep, okay. Um, all right, let's get now carefully rash to the end. I, actually, one before. Um, what, uh, quite, well, I'll read it. The, Trump has said that he plans to over... Oh, no, no. Although people are here. We could, we could uh, that's another whole, well, let's not get into that, but... Uh, but uh, well, let me tell you briefly, here's the deal about Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall was repealed in 1999. The notion that Glass-Steagall would have prevented all this is refuted by the fact that almost all the bad stuff that we were hurt by had happened while Glass-Steagall was still in effect. The f okay, so, well, all right, shut up. Am I lying? Um, Excuse me. Okay. I, let, let, actually, let me let me just say one more word here, which was that. Can I just? I do want to continue. This is my friend from Larouche. I want to say one other thing. Okay, let him do it. No, I got to say one other thing. We disagree about. I do not think Queen Elizabeth is still running England, contrary uh, to your okay. views. Okay. All right. Great. Um, actually, so we're at we're at a point where I can just uh, let let's 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 stop talking financial reform because we're all right. Um, a lot of people have come here to hear something. Um, folks, well, let me, this is the Lyndon LaRouche contingent. Yeah. To use the technical term, they are nuts. Yes. <laughs> okay, folks. Um, let us. Uh, all right. We're 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 coming. Please. We need this. Um. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let, Let me just repeat. And there's a debate about Glass Eagle being reinstated or not. Um, but the fact is that it was not repealed until 1999. I voted against the repeal, by the way, because I thought it should have been replaced with, with better regulation. But the fact is that by 1999, almost all the bad stuff had happened. So the notion that Glass Eagle would have prevented it doesn't make any sense since you have to assume that all the bad stuff happened beginning of the year 2000 well, and the whole crisis built up in six years. And also, by the way, the Lehman Brothers was a standalone investment bank not affected by... Right, and AIG were not AIG covered was, by... So neither, yeah. And all one right. last point. 
uh, under Glass-Steagall, subprime loans to people who couldn't repay them would have been perfectly legal. All Glass-Steagall said was banks have to make the loans and they can't do the underwriting. But nothing in Glass-Steagall would have prevented the, uh, uh, the bad mortgages. Okay. We're at almost at the end, so let's just ask, what, what do you think just happened a few, a few weeks ago? How did, how did we end up with this uh, election? I know. Well, first of all. And we could, of course, spend hours on it. I just want to vote. One, we should not. Um, the LaRouche people come in pairs, probably, so there's probably another one out yeah. there. Um, the, um, this is a, what I think happened was that the establishment types who were running economic policy have been insufficiently concerned about inequality. That the fact that growth was happening in the face of unfair distribution was a mistake. And it, we should not think of this just some American weakness. It's not just, and, and I, in defense of Hillary Clinton, she got more votes than Donald Trump did. She got a majority. She did much better than Renzi or than the British staying in the European Union or Francois Hollande of blessed memory. Right. Um, the fact is that there was, and I think this is a great mistake, and here was a mistake. I'll talk about Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Both agreed that the way the economy was working and trade became the visible symbol of it because it was a contributor, not as much of a factor, I believe, as many people thought, but it was the one thing they could sort of focus on. The argument of both Clinton and Obama was, here's what we're going to do. We agree that we need some offsets because trade increases inequality. So we have a two-step process. We'll do the trade bills, and then we'll pass some laws that offset its negative effects. The problem with that politically was they got Republican support to pass their trade bills and then opposition to offsetting the effects. And I begged them both, do it in one package. Do it, do it as one thing. Do not do it in two steps. And I think that's finally uh, uh, what happened. And it is worldwide, the sense that uh, things were done uh, un unfairly. I also, look, there's one other thing that Trump has said. Um, I say that I have some agreement with his appeal, and that is, it was, well, let me, there were two rules that always frustrated me that did get broken this year. One was that it's America's duty to be the, uh, the, the keeper of order in the world. That America, if things are really going bad, America's got to step in. That it's our fault if there is a problem, as I read today, in, uh, if, if there is uh, an insurgency in Niger, that America needs to have some special forces there. Um, I wish we could control some of that, but we have overspent for that. Secondly, and this is one of the things that, until recently, was a problem. Going forward, it won't be. Concern about the distribution of income should not be allowed to displace the focus on growth as the single most important policy goal. And in fact, if you get too hung up on the distribution, you are engaging in class warfare. One of the things I am pleased to note this year is that nobody has used that phrase. Um, so I think that's what happened, was that including some of the liberal establishment people were just deferring for too long dealing with the, uh, the uh, inequality. There are a couple of other things. I think there were some cultural issues. I will say the most controversial one, which I'm going to get into, and I hope to write about it some more. Climate change is very important. We can't compromise on climate change. And we can't compromise on clean water. And we can't compromise if getting rid of acid rain was a good thing. Getting lead out of the water in most places was a good thing. Lead out of the, out of, out of the uh, kids' brains. But there has been too much focus on what I consider to be some of the more cultural and philosophical aspects of environmentalism, particularly the notion that the Endangered Species Act and clean and, and uh, wetlands were absolute barriers to things going on. Um, I, I think that we have got to be, uh, that we, we, we in, angered a lot of people by the, in, the, the refusal to treat those as balances. A um, couple other things, I think, cumulatively. Uh, I think we should have this very real position. We are here, I believe my job is to protect people from other people. 
I do not think we should, as a rule, try to protect people from themselves. When you start telling them that they're drinking too much soda and they shouldn't smoke e-cigarettes, you not only piss them off, but you alienate the people who are in the business of trying to meet those consumer demands. I think these are side issues. Last one, maybe the most controversial, but I think I can say it because I've been saying this as a gay man to other gay and lesbian and transgender and bisexual people. This is addressed to the groups on whose behalf we have fought. Yes, I don't ask you to compromise on your goals. I didn't compromise on any of the goals of the LGBT movement. I do ask that those of us who are members of these groups take into consideration the political impact about how we press them. And I particularly want to say to all of those groups, it is not in our interest, because I speak as a member of one of them, to insist on our allies phrasing things and, and giving us psychic income to the point where we endanger their ability to win the elections that help us. I think we've got to be more willing to give people a pass. I, I, my view is this. You, I will never say anything that isn't true. But I don't always have to say everything that is true at all times. And I do think, I'll give you an example. I, I mean, I was an opponent of Bernie Sanders in the primary. But I thought when the people on behalf of Black Lives Matter who disrupted Bernie Sanders rally to demand that he show them that rhetorical allegiance, that that was not only unfair to Bernie Sanders, who should not have to have had at this point in his long career, a long career which he managed to present people, that he was a newcomer, which was very impressive for a guy, <laughs> for a guy 26 years in Congress, but um, forcing Bernie Sanders, sort of humiliating, demanding this tribute from Bernie Sanders to pay tribute to this rhetorical phrase, that's the kind of thing people got to stop doing. But it's fundamentally the economics. And again, it's worldwide. It's England, it's France, where now the choice is going to be between uh, Le Pen and Fillon, who is to the right of anybody in France except Le Pen. Okay, I think uh, I'm going to leave it there, I, uh, but I'm going to remember that, that, that I think that's a great slogan. It's, it's you never, never say things that are not the truth, but you don't have to say everything that is you true. Say you tell the truth, <laughs> the whole truth. No, you tell the truth and nothing but the truth, but if they want the whole truth, let them get a subpoena. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. And one last thing. And here I am speaking from I told you so. Don't put all that embarrassing stuff in emails. I do not understand why intelligent adults would put down in emails. And I will quote you what I learned when Jim Stone and I first were working together years ago in the city of Boston. 1967, I went to work. Jim's a little younger. He came on a little bit later. But what we were told was, kid, you never write when you can talk. You never talk when you can nod and you never nod when you can wink.